What's really special tonight is our special guest, Leonard Malton. The thing about Leonard, of all the work he's done and the teaching in 30 years on Entertainment Tonight and teaching at USC, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, one of the things I love about Leonard, uh, aside from him being a personal friend, is he's just a fan, just like us. And in all of his writings, in all of his teachings and everything, that love of being a movie fan and loving the movies always comes through. And he also picked tonight's film. So with that, please give a warm Palm Springs welcome to the one, the only, the great Leonard Maltin. I don't take this kind of thing for granted. I really, really don't. I've had such a wonderful life, not over yet, but, uh, but so many serendipitous things have happened to me. And that's what I write about mostly in my book. Absolutely. And uh, nothing was planned. Right. Can I tell a story? I've been out there signing books uh, with Jeff Mantor of the beloved Larry Edmonds Bookshop on Hollywood Boulevard. Still there. 1938, I believe it was open. My first trip to Hollywood mm -hmm. was one of the must see, the must see stops on my agenda. Book signings are not my favorite thing <laughs> because I've had too many sour experiences. <laughs> uh, I was just telling Jeff and Alan about the, the book signing where no one showed up. <laughs> I've been to, I've had many where few people showed up, but this was really frustrating because not a soul was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the ones where only like one or two people <laughs> showed up was in Cleveland. The uh, book manager had gotten in a healthy number of copies of my new mm -hmm. book. And there was a guy who was sort of hanging around. He wasn't in line, mm -hmm. wasn't buying a book. He just started hanging around, and at a certain point, he made his way over to me and, and, and said, I don't want to buy a book, but I, I would like to request your autograph. I said, sure. <laughs> and he gave me an autograph, you know, like the old standard mm -hmm. autograph book. And I noticed that it was numbered. Mm -hmm. And what's more, the page that I was signing was numbered. So I asked him about it. Well, he said, now this, this is in the 70s. Uh, I said, so how long have you been collecting autographs? He said, well, I, I was in World War II and I got mustered out in Los Angeles and the Hollywood canteen was still in operation. And I used to go there and see some of the stars and that's what sort of got me started mm -hmm. on, you know, on collecting. I said, who's the toughest autograph that you landed? He said, well, there are two. Uh, when George McGovern was running for president, Paul Newman came through town to do some speeches on his behalf. Mm -hmm. And I figured out which hotel he would be almost certain to be staying at. Mm -hmm. And I got up early and went to the parking lot mm -hmm. and stood there at 7 in the morning. And sure enough, Newman comes out with a Coors in his hand. <laughs> I think he did a lot of beer and then sit-ups. <laughs> <laughs> sipping that, and I approached him and asked if he'd give me an autograph, and he said, I I'm sorry, I, I just don't do that. He said, want to have a beer on me? <laughs> and uh, so he wasn't being hostile. No. Yeah, but he, he just didn't, didn't do autographs. Yeah, just, and <laughs> this guy looked Newman square in the face and said, Clark Gable signed for me and you won't? <laughs> <laughs> give me the book. <laughs> so one of his th that became one of his regular uh, uh, bits was he would get an entire team mm -hmm. uh, baseball, basketball, football, whatever so he was doing so with one of the Cleveland teams and he got to this one player and the one player said sorry, I don't mean to be rude but I, I just don't don't do autographs he looked the guy right in the eyes and he said Martin Luther King signed for me, <laughs> and you won't. 
there you go. Isn't that great? Go. That is great. That is great. Well, <laughs> uh, aside from movies, uh, one thing that you mentioned recently that uh, we both have in common is when you were in either middle school, like to, you had a indifferent uh, dislike of math. Yeah. Uh, it, was it was intense. It was intense, dislike. yes. Mine was too. Mine was too. And what did you, you, you mentioned that you were doing something in math class that kind of foreshadowed well, where you would go. I used to doodle like a lot of kids, I guess. Uh, and, but my doodling tended to be somewhat obsessive. Uh, <laughs> I would... Oh, I would doodle all of the movie uh, studio uh, trademarks, mm -hmm. logos. The Columbia Lady and Leo the Lion and Paramount mm -hmm. Mountain. That was one of my favorite pastimes. And then I would test my memory, see how many Humphrey Bogart movies I could name. <laughs> I think he made 75 feature films. Yeah. And uh, I would try to make a list in roughly chronological order, all, all of Bogart's movies. And I got pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. but, so one, one day I decided, well, let, let me try Carol Lombard. I'd become a, a fan of hers by then. Right. Uh, with a lot of help from The Late Show, uh, this is something that, uh, again, today's generation with the Advent of video, home video, VHS, yeah. then DVD, then Blu-ray, yeah. Laserdisc, Cable, and now streaming. All of it. I used to have to force myself to go to sleep early on a school night and set the alarm for 2.30 in the morning, <laughs> get up and go to the, the, the living room and keep the volume low so as not to wake up the household in order to see 20th century with Carol Lombard and John right. Barrymore. Right. My brother and I did the same thing for On the Waterfront because mm -hmm. they had The Late Show and then they had The Late Late Show. Yep. Yeah. So I was on a Carol Lombard kick. And you wrote my, a book about her, correct? Yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, so my math teacher, uh, who really loved her subject, to give credit where credit is due, she used to talk about the beauty of equations. <laughs> I, I never saw it. I never saw it. Yeah. Or felt it, certainly. Right. So she caught me right in the middle of class, uh, not paying attention, and uh, said, what's this? And I said, well, I'm just doodling. Oh, what's this? I said, well, it's a list of Carol Lombard movies. She said, Carol Lombard? But she's dead. <laughs> and uh, it's like, well, she couldn't. I couldn't see the beauty in equations, and she couldn't see the relevance of m memorizing <laughs> Carol Lombard's films. But I could, because I really cared about them, and I was especially envious of films I hadn't seen yet. Not right. envious, but yeah. frustrated that I hadn't been able to see all the titles I wanted to. Right. Uh, it's just the way my brain worked, right. and possibly still does. Right. And I think one of the points that, that you've made, and I think I've made, is that there's no such thing as old movies. If you haven't seen it, yep. or even if you have seen it, if it's good, it's good. It's not yeah. old, right? Like an old joke. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. There, there's, no such, there's no such thing. Uh, before we move on and talk about tonight's movie, which, which you picked, and I'll, I'll ask you, uh, why you picked it, or uh, what you think of it. Uh, your book, Starstruck, has so many great stories in it, but when I read it, there was one that made me laugh so hard, I dropped the book and I laughed and I was drinking hot tea and I squirted it through my nose. Could you very briefly tell the Robert Mitchum story with the can at, the, at the screening where he Oh, well, this is a day never, that will, will never be lost to memory for me. Uh, uh, <laughs> I went to New York University, and I signed on to the uh, very professional daily newspaper we used to publish, uh, Monday through Thursday. It was called the Washington Square Journal then. <laughs> and uh, we, I, I even used to go to the type shop one night a week when I became the entertainment editor. Mm -hmm. Hot type, linotype, 
<laughs> yeah. Hold uh, the presses. You bet. Yeah. I mean, Sam Fuller had nothing on, yeah. on, on yeah. Lee Tracy. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it was a fascinating uh, opportunity to see something that would soon be obsolete. Mm -hmm. One day a phone rang in the office, and it was a publicist from MGM asking if I would like to attend a press conference the following afternoon at the MGM screening room in Midtown. Uh, for uh, the upcoming David Lean film, Ryan's Daughter. And Robert Mitchum would be there. That's an easy one, sure. What time <laughs> do you want me? Yeah. So at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, whatever. So I, I, I went there. And that night, I looked up some stuff to refresh mm -hmm. my memory. Uh, titles I would, if, if given a chance, I would like to ask him about working sure. on. The MGM screening was a decent size, maybe mm -hmm. 75 seats, maybe 100 at most. And we're all there and no Mitchum. Mm -hmm. And the publicists are pacing yeah. right. back and forth, looking uh, really concerned and upset. And uh, they, they show us the trailer. Right. All right, there's the trailer. Uh, and then there's this like, awkward stage pause. And then, boom, he's there. He's coming in the back of the screening room holding a duffel bag a large size duffel bag. <laughs> and he starts talking as he approaches the, uh, the, the front of the room. He says, hey everybody, sorry to keep you waiting, but uh, I'm not trying to imitate him, by the way, just his attitude. <laughs> I'm trying to give you an idea of his attitude. He said, uh, sorry to keep you waiting, but I'm gonna have to fly through Chicago tonight, and I've got this brick of marijuana, and, and uh, <laughs> they're, gonna, they're gonna catch it for sure. I gotta sift it down. <laughs> So he goes to a seat near the front of the, of the house and proceeds to do just that. <laughs> and now the publicists are you know, <laughs> They're crawling. They, they, they don't know which way to run. And one of them approaches him very gingerly and said, uh, would you mind going up to the podium and just answering some, some questions? No, no, no. Uh, can I get someone to help me here? He recruits one of the college journalists <laughs> to sift his marijuana. <laughs> and that's the little background for the, for the rest of the afternoon. He uh, goes to the podium and they say, uh, would you mind narrating some footage? We have some behind the scenes footage. So they show some behind the scenes footage on location in Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, and he says, uh, oh, there's uh, David Lean, great, great director. Uh, that's Sarah Miles, she's the leading lady. <laughs> totally unsavory person, but a great leading lady. <laughs> <laughs> he goes on like, now again, they don't know whether to just, you know, dive into a hole <laughs> in the floor or what to do. And, uh, and they show one more little promo reel. And then they open it to the floor for questions. And as with most press conferences that I've ever been uh, allowed to attend, nothing good comes from press conference questions. <laughs> press conference questions stink. And I'm talking about at the global level, you know, yeah. in, in Washington. It's rare that you hear very much intelligent conversation. Right. But... I'm not trying to pin a rose on, on, on me here, but I, it's just that I was sure. interested in things other than Ryan's daughter. And I right. said, what was it like being directed by Charles Lawton in The Night of the Hunter? He loved him. And he, and he went, well, it's like, he, it's like he, if he wasn't already standing, he stood up at attention. He said he was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And he went, didn't elaborate too much, but yeah. he was happy to talk about it. And then I asked him about John Houston. And he said, Houston didn't say very much. He says, but we do a take and he'd say, a little more, son. Yeah. And I knew just what he meant. And right. he did a dead on impression of John Houston. Oh yeah. While, while telling that story. So I came away with gold. That's Not great. a lot, because yeah. I couldn't dominate you know, the, sure. the whole afternoon. Sure. But I came away with gold. Mm -hmm. And the next day I got a call from my MGM representative asking mm -hmm. if I would agree not to print a word <laughs> about anything that, that, that happened that day. <laughs> and I said, okay. And I kept my promise for 50 years. <laughs>
great story. That is well, a great that's, story. That's in my book. That's a great I, story. I saved it up. Um, when I asked Leonard here, I said, uh, pick a film. Tell me what film you'd like to see. Uh, you know, I, I somehow telling Leonard Malton, I want you to introduce this film or this film, I, it, it, that never occurred to me. And we had a discussion uh, of which his wife Alice, of course, participated. Uh, because Leonard's marriage, Alice will be here this weekend, and his marriage is the truest definition of a partnership that I have ever seen. Uh, it's fabulous. And uh, so they live by night. Nick, Nicholas Ray's first picture, produced by John Hausman, starring uh, Farley Granger and Kathy O'Donnell. Uh, why did you pick the picture, and some thoughts about it? Partly because it's been a while since I've seen it. <laughs> and certainly a while since I've seen it projected on a screen. <laughs> and uh, so I figured why not take advantage of this opportunity. Absolutely. And I'm happy that it turned out. Mm -hmm. I mean, f film noir, uh, you know, buffs, hardcore, diehard film noir buffs know it because it's considered one of the best of the genre. And there's a good reason for that. Uh, the, the casting is, is perfect. It's Farley Granger and Kathy O'Donnell, and they were both fairly young, uh, and certainly young in their careers. Kathy O'Donnell had just been uh, signed a few years ago by Sam Goldwyn, who featured her in The Best Years of Our Lives. Right. And so she'd been showcased already in that prestigious mm -hmm. and successful movie. Um, Farley Granger had had a little bumpier start, also with Mr. Goldwyn, mm -hmm. uh, to whom he owed several more pictures. They wound up going back and making more for him. Mm -hmm. But they're, uh, they're just perfect in, in the leads of this story. And it's a story that was written during the Depression. And uh, this is and it's produced in the post-World War II era. So already it was a period piece when it was made. Right. Um, and uh, which is interesting in itself, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, the story was uh, optioned by uh, RKO in the early 40s, mm -hmm. uh, when John Hausman was first working with Mr. Wells on Citizen Kane. And uh, uh, he, they, they bought the rights, they bought the screen rights, and, um, but didn't make it. And uh, in the late 40s, John Halpin tried again, get the juice, <laughs> right. to, to, to turn it into a real breathing motion picture. And by that time, he'd become acquainted with uh, the director. Nicholas Ray, I don't know a whole lot about his background, but Nicholas Ray, like Anthony Mann and other sort of culty directors, mm -hmm. uh, was not a, a movie guy. He was a theater guy. Yeah. And yet he'd had all sorts of real world experience. Mm -hmm. He traveled with Alan Lomax around the country uh, in the 30s uh, on the WPA projects mm -hmm. of uh, uh, recording folk songs, right. folk music around the country. Imagine that. Yeah. Uh, well, Hausman, Hausman said that this was Nick Ray. He had Nick Ray write this piece, really, mm -hmm. and he said because of uh, the background that you just stated, this was Nick Ray's wheelhouse in yeah. doing this. And I think, you know, he had to keep going back to the well to get it made, and it was because it was in that brief window when Dory Sherry right. was at RKO. And then th that was the, just as it was the departure of an executive at RKO that uh, ended Orson Welles' career at that <laughs> studio. Right. Uh, it was the arrival of Dory Sherry that put this film on the screen. Right. Uh, with. With, with Nick Ray uh, directing and from his own script. Right. Uh, sometimes it, it can be uh, uh, charted after the fact, but predicted, no. Yeah. You can't predict when and how it's going to happen. It sat for two years. Yeah. It sat on the shelf. Farley Granger and Kathy O'Donnell were not box office names, mm -hmm. and so they couldn't sell it. Uh, on, on the strength of the marquee names. Howard De Silva 
was building a reputation as a character actor, mm -hmm. but not yet fully established. There was no energy. There was no yeah, there imperative. Was no oomph. There was no star There was no oomph. imperative yeah. about getting it out there into the theaters. Right. And then finally it made its way out into release, where it was well received by the critics mm -hmm. and lost a lot of money. Yep. <laughs> it lost over $400,000. And it was not that expensive a film to make. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it uh, did no one any great favors in the short run. Yeah. Uh, but it's given us a, a, a remarkable movie to look back on. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that is known about it is, and I, I almost don't want to say anything ahead of time, but it would be wrong for me not to point it out. There's use of helicopter shots. No one can find another film that precedes it. That's true. That uses helicopter shots dramatically. And uh, they thought of it and did it. Even the title was up for, for, for grabs. They, mm -hmm. they tried three or four different alternate titles. And I have a piece of sheet music, uh, <laughs> among the other movie things that I collect. Uh, one, or, one or two in your yeah, house, right? Just a few. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a scene where Marie Bryant sings a song called Your Red Wagon. And somebody said, well, let's make that the title of the movie. <laughs> that sounds like Jack Warner or something he yeah. would come up with. Yeah. It's, yeah. you know, it, 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 once you've seen the film, and you've seen the scene where, where she right. sings the song, it makes sense somewhat, but it's, it's just the wrong way to try to pitch that movie. Yeah. You know, uh, well, I, I think I can't think of two better titles that have begun and end and close to ending a film festival than they live by night and I wake up screaming. <laughs> <laughs> so nice, nice. So, uh, uh, <laughs> and the, the P.S. to all of this is that several decades later, Robert Altman, uh, right. I don't know who brought it to his attention. Yeah. But Robert Altman remade it under the title Thieves Like, like Us. Yeah. Right. And that's a terrific movie, too. Yeah. And it starred uh, young Keith Carradine and equally young uh, Shelley um, Duvall. Right. And, uh, and some of the members of Altman's then burgeoning stock company. Right. Uh, uh, John Shuck, Burt Remsen, people like that who, who added so much to his movies. It's not that one movie is better than the other. They're both really good. Yep. In, and in my estimation. And we're going to see the original, the good one, right now. And I mean, I could go on with Leonard indefinitely, but the good thing is he's going to be here all weekend, folks. You know? I'm, it's like the hair club for men. I like it so much I bought the company. The company. <laughs> I like what you're doing at this festival so much I'm going to attend it. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, a legendary critic, but a movie fan, and one of the nicest people on the face of the earth. Thank you, Leonard, for coming out and doing this. Thank you this. for having me. Thank you for coming. We're going to watch They Live By Night. Thank you.